In the autumn of 1984, Joseph Fritzl led his 18-year-old daughter into the cellar of their family home. He then locked her into a section of the cellar that he had specifically created for this purpose. For the next 24 years, he kept her incarcerated. And over those 24 years, he sexually abused her, as a result of which she had seven children. Of those seven children, he took three to be raised in the family home. Three he left with her mother to live out their lives in the airless, lightless dungeon. The other child died three days after being born, of a condition that could have been cured had Fritzl sought medical care for that child. The body of the child was later incinerated by Fritzl. When, in 2008, the horror of this story came to light, the world was appalled. He was labelled as evil. He was called a monster. His actions were universally condemned. Why is it that we think, all of us think, that Fritzl's actions were abhorrent? Why is it that we can label him as evil? Why is it that we can say that Fritzl is not good and morally bankrupt? What makes something good? What makes something moral? There are those that think that goodness and morality come from God. Or at least the standards of goodness and morality come from God. Here we see William Lane Craig addressing Euthyphro's dilemma, and during which he describes God's nature and character as follows. God is by nature essentially compassionate, just, fair, kind, loving, and so forth. And because he is compassionate, just, fair, kind, loving, add to that the previous descriptions Craig has given of God, all loving, morally perfect. This is not the God I recognize from the Bible. How is it that Craig can use these words to describe his God? The only evidence that we have of God's nature and character comes from the Bible, a book which its adherents constantly remind us is the Word of God, the inerrant, inspired, infallible Word of the one true God. So what can we learn of God's nature and character from the Bible? Let's start at the beginning. The one thing that we can be sure of is that God thought that his creation was good. But it was not good. His creation had some serious design flaws. A talking serpent with bad intent, a tree with forbidden fruit, and a woman imbued with curiosity. It was inevitable that everything would go wrong. Any tenth-rate designer could have told you that. Either God saw it coming and did nothing, or he was incompetent, or he didn't care. Imagine a parent leaving their child in a room full of bare electrical cables. And when the inevitable happens, that parent saying, Oh well, I wanted to allow my child freedom to experiment and learn and explore. You would have scant respect for that parent. But apparently, although we are all God's children, the same criticism of that child's parent cannot be levelled at God. I can already hear the cries of the apologists. Free will! they will say. And indeed, Craig makes reference to this when he addresses the question of evil. From a Christian perspective, God didn't invent evil. Rather, he created free moral agents who have the ability either to obey God and do his will or to seek lesser goods rather than have their wills oriented toward God as the supreme good. And evil, as I understand it, is a privation of right order in the creaturely will. Whoa, just pausing there, in case you missed it. This is what Craig just said. Evil, as I understand it, is a privation of right order in the creaturely will. Any Craig fans that might be watching, please make a video response telling me what that means. Anyway, he goes on. It is... A, a, an absence of being correctly ordered toward God as the supreme good and focused instead on, and on lesser good. So evil is the byproduct of the misuse of human freedom, which is necessary for us to be moral agents who make significant moral choices. Apart from that, we would be mere animals or robots or puppets, and that's not the kind of uh, being that God wants. 
that's not the sort of person God wants. Presumably God wants man to come freely to him. But when man does not come freely to him, then what? Man is destroyed, whether by flood or otherwise, it doesn't really matter, because he's going to end up in an eternal torment of fire, burning in hell. Where is this free will? Where is the freedom not to believe? What are the consequences of exercising this free will in a manner not conducive with God's expectations? An eternity of damnation. This is not freedom. This is, as Hitchens has described, a celestial dictatorship. Only a few chapters after the creation account, and God is having regrets. His grand design has gone pear-shaped. There is too much evil in the world. Evil, you know, that privation of right order in the creaturely will. So he commits global genocide. You see, this is what happens if you exercise your free will in a way which the dictator is not happy with. Every man, woman and child must die. Not painlessly, not quietly in their sleep, which we have to assume was within God's powers to do if he so wished. No, he decides to drown everyone. And this act is celebrated by some in the form of children's games, toys and songs. But one moment's thought must surely make any rational person appreciate the true horror of this act. How the orchestrator of such an atrocity could be considered, or can be considered, compassionate, just, fair, kind, loving, and so forth, it is beyond me. And what did the animals do to deserve the same treatment? You do not have to have studied law to have an understanding of justice. You do not have to have studied law to appreciate that punishing someone for the crimes of another is unjust. But God has got no problem with that, as we see from many Bible passages, visiting the iniquities of the father unto the third and fourth generation. God has got no problem with punishing everyone ever born as a result of Eve's dietary mistake. But worst of all, consider yourself a judge passing sentence. A murderer stands before you, someone guilty of the most heinous crimes. In his mitigation, he says, I'm sorry, would that curry favour with you? Perhaps it may be true, perhaps he is genuinely sorry. Would you then say to him, OK, you don't need to be punished. In fact, rather than punishment, I order that you go and live in a wonderful palace where all your needs and desires are satisfied. I doubt it. Why? Because that would not concord with any form of justice that is palatable to you. But God's got no problem with that. The most depraved sinner can do just that and get to heaven. However, a person who leads a blameless life, a moral life, who is good in all regards, but who does not believe in God, will be tortured for eternity. How is this justice, or just? In part four, we will continue examining God's nature and character, and compare it with Joseph Fritzl, and ask, which one of them is the greater monster?